All right. Like Wes said, I'm Blake Davidson. I'm one of the emergency medicine fellows at UAB. Uh, I'm originally from Arkansas, trained up in Kentucky for residency. I'm heading back there in, in July. I'm just completing my tour of the South around here. Um, today, I got uh, tasked with the lovely, uh, always interesting emergency endocrine um, topics. There aren't that many that we need to go of, and at the end of this lecture, we'll actually go over some EKGs and some other, um, some other interesting topics as well. Um, but we'll kind of talk about some of these endocrine um, um, abnormalities or problems that people can have and how to recognize them so that, um, you know, we, we may not be able to get behind the, the eight ball in some of these patients. Um, the biggest one or the one that we will see most often and is the most um, uh, most deadly, I think, here uh, from what we would see is is complications of diabetes. Right, it's the, it's very very prevalent within the uh, within the United States, obviously, and I'm probably only getting more so. Um, just starting an intro, we talk about what is diabetes and uh, what is the uh, what is the pathophys of of what's actually going on. So. Um, we got our pancreas here, and the pancreas sits right behind the stomach within the body, right? Um, you've got your big, I can't use my laser, but we've got our big uh, blood vessels with our aorta and your um, uh, arteries that are going into the liver here. The bile duct comes down from the liver, um, leaves, the, leaves the gallbladder, and actually runs through the pancreatic duct. Um, it runs through the pancreas and uh, joins the pancreatic duct to actually drain in the, into the duodenum. The pancreas is mostly responsible for creating digestive enzymes um, and also creating um, and, and making insulin and glucagon. All right, it's got a few different uh, different types of cells within it. There are called alpha cells, which are responsible for uh, glucagon and secrete glucagon in response to low glucose to make the body um, create more glucose. And then there's the beta cells. The beta cells are the ones that are actually responsible for insulin production, and those uh, are regulated by high glucose levels, right? So whenever the body senses the glucose that generally is in the 120s to 150 range, you're going to secrete insulin, and, um, and your body is going to help regulate that, right? The remainder of the function is for um, release of enzymes such as lipase and amylase to help break down foods. And then again, we talk about the bile duct coming through. So anybody that has like a, has gallstones and um, they look jaundiced, they look yellow. What is what has really happened is the gallstone has left the left the bile duct um, and has lodged in here and started to back up into the liver. It can all they can also get lodged in here. And so patients that have gallstones that um, kind of fall within the pancreas and starts to block the pancreas, you can give what's called gallstone pancreatitis as well. So just kind of from an anatomy standpoint while we're here. Um, so just talking about prevalence of diabetes and why this is important is um, uh, it is one of the most common things that we'll see here in the United States. Most of the cases are going to be type 2 diabetes, right? So acquired diabetes, diabetes that most people are going to find out they have at, at an older age. Um, generally not within what's in childhood. Type 1 diabetes is about 5 to 10% of the total cases, um, and it is an autoimmune process, right? So your body has is fighting against itself, and it destroys those beta cells that we talked about a little bit ago, the ones that create insulin. So in type 1 diabetes, this is a true insulin deficiency, meaning that their body cannot make insulin, and that is the problem, right? It's not the fact that they're insulin resistant or that um, it doesn't work for them. It's just that their body doesn't make it, so we have to we have to give it to them. Um, most of the time, this is going to be a childhood a childhood disease or something that you find within uh, within the first few years of life, meaning uh, kids less than ten or so. Um, and the initial treatment with these kids is insulin, right? They don't have insulin. These oral medications that we have, most of the oral medications that we have, are designed to help. Uh, uh, increase insulin production, right? Well, these kids don't have beta cells, or these people don't have beta cells, so they can't make the insulin needed. Type 2 diabetes is the one that um, that is most common that we're going to see, right? These are ones that um, are found in older older patients, uh, mostly um, associated with obesity and uh, decreased uh, physical activity. So this is not that people, the, this is not really in the situation in that um, they don't create insulin is that their body creates a resistance to it, right? The insulin doesn't work for them anymore, 
right? they need more insulin in order to be able to get the the same uh, the same or the same product end goal. Um, the initial treatment for most of these patients is around is is oral medications, right? So that's why patients normally start on metformin. There's a bunch of different drugs nowadays, and it's kind of important for you guys to be a little familiar with some of these drugs because there are some other um, associations with some of these medications that um, that we'll talk about here in a little bit. One of them is called uh, euglycemic DKA, meaning that patients can have a normal blood sugar, but they can be in DKA just based off some of the how some of these medicines work. Um, it's important because diabetes is the major is the major cause of uh, coronary, artery, coronary artery disease and stroke, and is the seventh leading cause of death in the United States. So 2018, I believe that was. And again, talking more about prevalence and why this is important and why we keep talking about it, um, and you hear about it all the time, is it affects around 34.2 million people within the United States, around 10% of the population. Um, 27 million of those actually knew that they had the disease, and around seven um, was was unrecognized. 16 million visits to the emergency departments in the United States were related to diabetes complaints. It's quite a bit and quite often, generally, you know, at least one a shift. The other thing that we need to think about when we're talking about, you know, DKA is the opposite of that, right? You got patients giving, giving themselves insulin, um, 235,000 visits related to hypoglycemia. Um, $327 billion spent on direct and in, uh, indirect medical cost of, of diabetes. Right, so talk about healthcare dollars in the United States, a large portion of it's going to di uh, diabetes management. So we got a case, right? So um, say you're getting called out to a six-year-old child for increased work of breathing. Uh, upon arrival, you have a small six-year-old child sitting there uh, with labored, rapid breathing. When listening to sounds, you um, like you're, when you're auscultating him, you notice that he's breathing on you and it smells kind of, he's got a fruity smell to his breath. Mom notes over the past week has been uh, increasing more water or increasing the amount that he's drinking water, peeing more frequently than usual, and he's had some nausea and vomiting. He also has had some abdominal pain earlier today as well. Got vitals on him. His heart rate's 130. His blood pressure is 90 over 60. O2 is 100% on room air, and his respiratory rate's 26. But what kind of jumps out to you guys in this in this case? Like, what are the key things? We kind of I've already kind of led as to what we're working toward here, but what are some big keys in the history that make us think of um, maybe this kid has diabetes? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. The increased thirst, the polydipsia, the increased urine, uh, polyuria. Uh, he's, he's breathing 26 times a minute, heart rate's up. And then the fruity smell, what's the fruity smell? Ketones, right? So he's got a, he's probably ketotic. And I'm going to see if this will work. Let's see, it's technology, so you never know. Okay, so this is streaming online too, Wes. Is that what see? Yep. Okay. So, and obviously, this kind of gives it away, but it's called Ku small breathing. Right. So this is this is something that is primarily associated, or what we talk when we talk about it, we primarily talk about it in the sense of DKA, right? This You're going to see this in any patient that is acidotic. And it's this very specific type of breathing, right? We're taking these big, deep breaths and, and or rapid breaths to try and get off. Uh, well, what's he trying to do whenever he's breathing this fast? Why, does our, why is this our body's mechanism of, of uh, reaction here? Right. So you're really trying to, he's acidotic, right? Our blood or our body gets rid of, from a respiratory standpoint, gets rid of acid by breathing CO2 off, right? CO2 is a, is a form of acid that we, that we try and get off. And so you take these big rapid breaths in order to be able to, uh, to get rid of that. And that's our body's compensation. In DKA, a lot of these kids, um, especially the kids that are doing this Kusmal breathing, you know, they're breathing 26 times a minute, but they actually kind of look okay. Um, they, it's a really odd thing that they're just like working really hard, but um, they're kind of chilling, hanging out. So uh, in DKA, it's a lab that's made, or it's a diagnosis that's made on lab values, right? So one we can have a high suspicion for uh, in the pre-hospital setting, but uh, we can't really say that someone is in true DKA just based off they have a blood sugar of, of 600, right? 
um, you know, we kind of need we need some other information. We're going to get our glucose and uh, need it to be elevated and anion gap based on their BNP. The bicarb needs to be low and then their pH, of course, needs to be acidotic, right? Less than 7.3. And generally they need to have ketonuria, right? They need to be have ketones within their urine. Um, why what happens during, during all of this stuff so hyperglycemia causes an osmotic diuresis right and it's meaning that you got sh sugar in your blood it gets all um, and it, it brings water into um, into the system and a lot and makes you pee off water right it's kind of like if you guys have ever heard the um, uh, the laxative that is a fake sugar called sorbitol have you ever read the the reviews of the sorbitol like sugar-free gummy bears no, I'm talking crazy here. The sugar for gummy bears, so it's a, it's like an osmotic uh, diuretic. Um, hyperglycemia causes osmotic diuresis, and, but what it does is basically it pulls water into your system and makes you uh, lose water, right? So these these kids are very, very, very dehydrated. That's what helps cause the polydipsia, right? They're so thirsty because their their body is getting rid of a bunch of water. Um, you have a uh, ketonemia, which causes the acidosis and the compensatory, uh, compensatory Kussmaul breathing, which we saw a little bit ago, right? The ketone production, your body is um, um, producing a ton of ketones and makes you acidotic. Um, and then, so another important thing, like if this is a patient that has known diabetes and um, uh, you think they may have DKA and you check a blood sugar and it's normal, um, try and ask them when was the last time they took insulin, right? Some of these patients might be on different types of insulin. Some of them are long acting, some of them are short acting. If they just took a short acting one, their glucose levels might actually be normal for a moment. And then that short acting insulin wears off and then it's back, uh, back up sky high. So kind of be aware of that. The main state of treatment is rehydration and correction of their hyperglycemia, right? So we talked about kind of um, these people are, are very dehydrated on the front end. Most of these patients are a few liters down by the time they get to us um, in, in the hospital and need a lot of fluids. Now, the important part is, is that they don't need to be drowned, right? This is a process that can be a little bit slow or used to. Some of the, the old teaching is that you give just a ton of fluids. You fluid, 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 fluids. But we can kind of uh, recognize now that they need a lot, but over a period of time, not all at once. And there are some complications that um, can be problematic if we overload them too fast. Mostly in the pre-hospital setting, our management should include obviously checking a blood sugar, um, some light fluids, uh, getting those started, and then just symptomatic management as needed, right? And a lot of these patients are going to be in nauseous, even a little Zofran, O2 as needed. Um, I'll talk about it here in a little bit if we have time, but you should, if if you have a uh, if you have a patient that is in uh, suspected DKA and you're um, and they're and you're thinking about intubating them, that is probably the wrong thought. These are some of the scariest um, intubations that you uh, you could ever have, and we'll talk about. I'll try and talk about the physiology behind that a little bit. But ideally, if they're breathing really really fast, and unless they just completely tire out, um, your main goal should never to be intubate them, especially. You know, if we're if we're talking about um, having RSI capabilities out in uh, more and more areas and uh, in more jurisdictions, I don't think that this is one that we should we should rush on to um, to intubate. It's one that I I've, I have not intubated a person in DKA yet, um, thankfully. Um, one important factor that we talked about, so the uh, SGL2 inhibitors um, are the ones are ones that kind of have the associated euglycemic uh, DKA. So what that the most of those end in flozin or, or gliflozin. Um, they're they're also associated with like UTIs as well. Um, so kind of be aware of that they they basically help the body get rid of glucose by peeing out sugar. So if you um, if you're thinking about that, then you, know, you got a bunch of sugar within your urinary system now, and that is a cesspool for infections. But they can also help. Uh, they can also cause euglycemic DKA. Hyperosmolar hyperglycemia. So this is another. This is a different term. Um, this is mostly seen in type two diabetics. DKA. Um, the old teaching is that you can only see DKA in type one diabetics. Okay, and then hyperosmolar hyperglycemia is only seen in type two diabetics. Uh, really true, but um, that is what you're mostly going to see. These are ones where you see these patients that have glucoses of like 
1200 or 1300 and these patients will look really really sick um, these are going to be markedly high glucose levels um, whenever we're making these diagnoses we add in a couple different um, lab tests to be able to make this and these patients actually may not have a significant t uh, ketosis uh, with within uh, uh, with their uh, disease process so complications of um, of dka right so one of the things we talked about is that they need they need a lot of fluids, right? And we want to be able to give them all the fluids that they need and help them, but we we need to do that in a um, in a very specific manner. If we flood them too quickly, some of the long term effects that we can get that we can see is the cerebral edema. Um, so cerebral edema, um, obviously associated with like head trauma, but really it's just kind of you've given so much fluids and now they're starting to have some swelling uh, within their uh, on their brain. This is generally a long a later effect, right? This happens around hours eight to ten of your resuscitation in a patient with DKA. So very rarely are you guys ever going to see this, but it could be something that has started, uh, or it could be something, uh, it could be a complication. Uh, that is something that started a long, long time ago. OK, so if we're transporting patients or doing inner hospital transports, any anybody that's listening that's doing any of this, any uh, med flight uh, medics that are listening, this is something that we kind of think about, right? These are patients that have maybe already been in the hospital for a little bit. Now we're trying to get them somewhere else or you've got a pediatric patient that we're trying to get them children's. Um, if you're in the middle of a transport and transporting a patient that has DKA and then they're normal and then all of a sudden they start to get altered, confused um, and, and have a, a acute change in mental status. The first thing that you should be thinking of is um, cerebral edema and treating them with mannitol or hypertonic saline, whatever you guys have on uh, on board. And it's something that you can treat prophylactically without having to get any lab tests, any CT scans or anything of that sort. It's something that needs to be managed pretty quickly. And again, the biggest the biggest um, thing to kind of help go against that uh, or the production of that is um, not doing a rapid correction of fluids. Potassium levels should be monitored. Um, does anybody know that's uh, on there? Um, so potassium levels are altered uh, are going to be kind of abnormal within DKA. It's not going to uh, reflect the body's true potassium levels just based on um, the shifts that happen within the within the cells, right? So um, whenever we give insulin, insulin helps push potassium into the cell. And so we need to be careful of what the what the body's um, potassium level is before we give it, right? Whenever a patient has hyperkalemia in the hospital, that's part of our treatment protocol, right? Is insulin, glucose, um, albuterol, and all that jazz to help help decrease their potassium levels. So we're giving them we're giving these patients in DKA a bunch of insulin. So we need to know what the what the actual level is. Generally for when you get the labs back or and we're not starting their insulin until we get this lab back, right? So if their potassium's over say 5.3, then we can give insulin without um, really any worries. If it's under that, we um, uh, will kind of need to replace um, the or give them fluids that have potassium in it. If it's below a certain level, we're going to replete the potassium until we even start the insulin. So um, that's one thing to kind of be aware of. And then obviously, if you give it, if you give their, ins if you start their insulin, the potassium levels three, and it gets lower than that, that sets them up for some pretty dangerous arrhythmias. Questions on diabetes for right now? What's up? Ago, I actually had a patient with a 1600 glucose. Um, we went through about four different monitors, all showing an error. Just wanting to make note that your mon your glucose monitor may not even read high. It will yeah. just straight say this isn't blood. Right. This is just, this is something. Are we trying to test different. the orange juice? Oh uh, yeah, yeah. That, that's almost what it was wanting to say. Um, wasn't until we started giving fluids and got it thinned out a little bit that yeah. we actually got a high reading and he uh at the hospital his glucose was something like 16 19 or yeah. something yeah and that's that would be the this hyperosmolar hypoglycemia yep so online we've got the question um are you moving away from insulin uh, bolus for example 10 or 5 uh, units bolus um asking moving towards the the infusion of 0.1 units per kilogram per hour yeah 
I, I hardly ever give a bolus in the ED. Now that's that's uh, uh, really going to be doctor dependent on um, whether a lot of people do give a bolus just to try and go ahead and get on top of things and it helps close the gap quicker and all this jazz. But um, I don't really care about that. I just start the drip. I don't I don't give a bolus, especially in insulin naive patients. Like if this is a new patient um, or a new diabetes case, I'm not going to give them a honking bolus of insulin. I'm going to leave that for the internal med docs and the endocrinologist to, to deal with. And again, you'd want to make sure you had potassium levels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Again, I wouldn't I wouldn't do any of that until I figured out what their uh, potassium was. Cool. So next we'll talk about um, uh, thyroid issues, right? This is supposed to be hypothyroidism, not hypothyroidism. Um, it's one that's a, a little less common, um, but it seems like everybody's on thyroid medications these days. Um, it's generally the overall prevalence of hypothyroidism is uh, up to 3.7% in the United States. Most of these are gonna be um, older people and it is largely um, a problem that is seen in females, right? 10 times more prevalent in females than it is in males. So just kind of getting into some of the, uh, the nitty gritty points. So primary hypothyroidism is a problem with, uh, with uh, the thyroid gland itself, right? So the thyroid gland is not functioning, right? Um, and it's caused by either somebody's had uh, maybe a thyroid tumor or a thyroid nodule, and they just decided to take the whole thing out. Um, or if anybody's had radiation to the neck from a head and neck cancer, that's helped, uh, that's killed the thyroid gland and it doesn't work anywhere any, anymore. Um, amiodarone is a common medication that can also, help, uh, that can also cause um, hypothyroidism. Secondary hypothyroidism is that the thyroid's not working because, or not, uh, it's not that the thyroid's not working, it's that it's not getting the stimulus it needs, right? So it's a deficiency of the thyroid uh, stimulating hormone from the pituitary gland. So this is a central problem. This is the problem within the, uh, within the brain and hypothalamus um, to be able to get the signal to the thyroid to do what it needs to do. Um, and this is, we'll, we'll talk more about each, uh, each of these here in a little bit. And then there's something called euthyroid 6 syndrome associated with low uh, 3T and 3, uh, T4 levels um, and a low TSH, who is clinically normal. Uh, so I don't have the, um, the drawing on here, but basically TSH is released from the brain, the, um, from the pituitary. It goes down to the thyroid uh, TSH stimulates the thyroid gland to produce T4 and T3, and uh, T4 is inactive. It is um, then translated into the blood and T3, and that's the thing that actually works, right? So it's kind of a long, uh, long mechanism. This patient we've got, um, next case is uh, you get to a scene, you got a 42-year-old female. She's altered. She's lethargic, uh, lying on the couch. Husband says she's been dealing with a you know, quote unquote, cold for the past few days. It's gotten progressively worse. Uh, she hasn't been able to take any of her meds. He's not sure exactly what she takes, but knows she takes something for blood pressure and thyroid. Hasn't taken anything for the past three days due to her illness. You get there, these are her vital signs. She's got a heart rate of 29, a blood pressure of 80 over 40. Uh, she's setting 90% on her air. Respiratory rate's 10, and she feels cool to your touch whenever she's, and she's modeled. Sick or not sick? Sick, right? So what's her issue? What do we think is our issue? Or what's on our differential here? Outside of the world of thyroid. Okay. Sepsis, heart block, pneumonia, she's been dealing with a cold, got thyroid issues. Have you guys heard of something called myxedema coma? Something we'll talk about here in a minute, right? For this lady, the number one thing should be sepsis, 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 okay? So we kind of treat, uh, we treat as this lady is infected, especially with her history of being, being kind of sick early on. Um, and we're gonna treat, we're gonna treat this lady uh, symptomatically, right? And her heart rate's super low, we're gonna, uh, put her on the monitor, pace her uh, if needed. We're going to give her some fluids to try and help this blood pressure out, give her some uh, oxygen, try and do, do our normal things. Um, but in the back of our mind, we're kind of trying to think, 
what are we what's what's going on with this gal? Mixed edema coma is caused by severe hypothyroidism. It is, um, it is often due to a secondary cause like sepsis, cold exposure, burns, congestive heart failure, um, uh, many other things. What you're going to see in these patients is severe bradycardia, hypotension, altered mental status, and uh, hypothermia. Right? Um, you can see normothermia, and what you would see that is in, in a septic patient where they're uh, normally going to be hypothermic, but their fever creates a normothermia, right? So it's kind of um, uh, kind of something you can see all these other things and then have a normal uh, patient with a normal temperature, but everything else kind of leads you to this diagnosis of mixed edema coma. Um, they're going to end up having an extremely high TSH, right? Their body knows that they need um, uh, they need to produce more thyroid hormone, but they just uh, they're just not doing it. Um, you also see hyponatremia and hypoglycemia due to decreased glucogenesis um, and decreased insulin clearance. So um, always check a blood sugar in these patients as well. Main thing in the pre-hospital management is what we talked about earlier, right? So this lady um, from a mixed edema con, I don't think many people are carrying um, levothyroxine on their trucks, right? So the main thing that we can do is treat, the, treat this person symptomatically, right? Uh, pace her as needed, give her a little bit of fluids, um, and, you know, if they end up needing to be intubated and uh, intubate them as, as we can or as needed and then warm them up, right? So try and keep them, uh, keep them warm. Most of these patients are going to be really cold. The other thing to think about is whenever we're, um, uh, these patients that are hypoventilatory, right? They can, they're already altered in, uh, in the first place. So they're not taking big, long, deep breaths. Um, and they can become even more altered due to their hypercarbia, which leads to even a uh, uh, even more decreased respiratory uh, respiratory status. Um, so now we're talking about hyperthyroidism, right? So this is essentially the the diagnoses or the the terms are uh, very similar. When we're talking about primary hyperthyroidism, right? This is the this is the thyroid uh, gland going in overdrive, right? Creating too much thyroid hormones. Secondary hyperthyroidism is caused by too much TSH, right? The, the pituitary gland now is creating too much uh, TSH. And then this is going to be the exact opposite of, uh, of, of symptoms here, right? These people are, are going to be always very hot. They're going to be sweating. Uh, they may have a fever. Um, and then they're going to be very, very hungry, but they're not going to be able to gain any weight uh, because their body is just burning through all of this energy. Uh, they have high, uh, high anxiety levels, and then uh, exophthalmos. So they know what that is. Just a fancy word for saying bug eyes. All right, these patients will have those. You see those patients that have eyes that kind of stick outside of their orbits um, is associated with um, hyperthyroidism. So this patient, um, you get to an oncology treatment center where patients undergoing chemotherapy, and she became altered. And when you get there, she is confused. She looks flushed, uh, is all red. She's sweating, tachycardic. And she's got an irregularly irregular pulse on exam. The thing about hyperthyroidism, but what caused it? Why would this lady undergoing oncology, you know, or un undergoing chemotherapy, all of a sudden uh, have a severe like hyperthyroidism flare? Iodine stimulates the thyroid gland, and some of these patients will get um, uh, radioactive iodine. And whenever they get that, it can cause them, if they have any thyroid issues, cause their thyroid to have an overproduction of thyroid hormone. There's also the thought of people that, um, whenever we get contrast in the CT scanner, it has a, it's a uh, radioactive iodine as well, that there is a, a slight risk of that. Um, I do believe it's different, uh, so I could be uh, mistaken in that, but. Um, that is that is a risk factor for um, what we call thyrotoxic toxicosis. So heart rate super elevated, pulse is regular, irregular, irregular. What do we think that? Uh, what kind of rhythm we think she might be in? What is that commonly irregular? If somebody tell you somebody's in irregular rhythm, AFib. AFib is the most common uh, most common rhythm uh, arrhythmia that you will find in uh, thyrotoxicosis. So generally, this is called like thyroid storm. Um, it's generally precipitated by an external factor. 
diagnosis here is largely clinical. Some of the stuff that, uh, some of the tests that we're going to get in the hospital um, are going to come back for a long time, and we need to go ahead and start treatment. Um, the treatment that we give for thyroid storm is given in a very particular order and has to be given in that order uh, or else you can uh, really harm somebody. So um, we give them propanolol if their heart rate is super high to lower their heart rate. Then we give them this PTU and or methimazole depending on um, their age, if they're pregnant or not, uh, but that kind of helps decrease the production of this thyroid hormone. And then we give them iodine. I know I just said that iodine can actually precipitate thyroid storm, but that's why we give them this PTU um, to kind of help counterbalance that. And then iodine also can um, hurt the thyroid as well. And it's a very uh, temperamental element. And then you give them steroids. Steroids is the last thing you give them that helps kind of decrease um, all of the effects as well. Again, pre-hospital management for these patients is one recognition kind of based off their off the vital signs. You got somebody that's febrile, altered, they're in new onset AFib at 32, uh, they're confused and their eyes are bulging out of their head. This is something that we can kind of, uh, we can think about, right? Um, and something to, uh, to mention whenever we're uh, assigning this patient out. And then obviously anybody that has altered mental status, um, we should check their blood sugar and correct as needed. Questions on thyroid stuff? Sweet. Um, okay, so next we'll talk about the adrenal glands. So the adrenal glands um, are important for many different regulatory factors within the, within the body. Um, it's got really four different layers. It's got three layers within the cortex of the adrenal gland, the um, uh, glomerulosa, the fasciculata and the reticularis. Each layer, um, I always know it as GFR, I think of it as the um, GFR for creatinine or for a kidney function um, going outside in. And then each layer has a different function, right? So the um, G portion is, uh, is responsible for creating uh, mineral cor uh, corticoids, such as cortisol. Um, the Fasciculata is responsible for glucocorticoids, and the reticularis is responsible for androgens or the sex hormones. Um, and those would be the main ones that, we, uh, that we're talking about. The medulla, the inside portion of the adrenal gland, is responsible for your catecholamines, uh, your catecholamine production. We talk about adrenal insufficiency, we're mostly talking about that outer layer, right? Those, um, uh, the cortex layers. Talk about primary insu in insufficiency. So again, this is primary, so we're talking about actual dysfunction of the adrenal gland. And we're talking about dysfunction of all of the cortex, the G layer, the R, F layer, and the R layer, right? So uh, you're losing your cortisol, your aldosterone, and your sex hormones. So we're gonna see a little bit, uh, we're gonna see all kinds of systemic issues whenever we have somebody um, that has primary adrenal insufficiency. And if somebody says they have Addison's disease, this is what they're talking about. OK, um, secondary adrenal deficiency is, um, again, the, the adrenal gland isn't getting the hormone to stimulate the production of whatever is needed. Now, generally, um, there are some other kind of backup um, uh, ways for the body to uh, continue to create aldosterone and your sex hormones, right? But your main cortisol uh, production is based on this this hypothalamic pituitary uh, regulatory system okay so in secondary adrenal insufficiency we're mostly talking about just a cortisol deficiency we'll talk about kind of how those two will present differently primary adrenal uh, insufficiency is mostly an auto autoimmune disorder is the is the main cause in the united states i mean we have a, a complete uh, destruction of the of the adrenal gland there are some drugs that can cause it um, etomidate is rumored to have um, have caused primary adrenal insufficiency um, and then ketoconazole is another drug infection is the most common cause worldwide and um, with uh, tuberculosis being the, the largest worldwide cause obviously um, not here in the united states you can see this also with uh, thrombosis or hemorrhage. It can, it can result as a complication from sepsis, uh, DIC, or meningococcal anemia. It can also be caused from massive blood loss as well. In these patients, we're mostly going to see hyponatremia, hyperkalemia, 
Um, they're also going to be hypotensive and have very poor vascular tone. You know, their, their vessels are going to be you know, leaky, quote unquote. Um, they're going to be hyperkalemic because these patients, the um, aldosterone um, helps regulate potassium within the body, right? So if your uh, potassium levels are high, your body produces um, aldosterone and um, helps get rid of that. You help urinate that out. So if we don't have aldosterone, you're going to um, see some effects of hyperkalemia, right? Um, secondary adrenal insufficiency is primarily a central cause, so a, pr a problem within the within the brain that's causing the uh, insufficient release of the stimulating hormone. So some of these patients are also going to have um, uh, some central causes, right? They may have headache, they may have vision changes, or some other symptoms to kind of help you lead toward what's um, uh, toward this diagnosis. Um, and again, we do have retention of the aldosterone production. So these patients may have a decreased sodium level, but their uh, potassium levels should be fine, right? Because the, um, the body still is able to produce aldosterone. Um, the second most common uh, cause of this is uh, exogenous steroid use. So anybody that's on very, very long-term steroids for any, uh, any purpose, they suddenly stop taking these steroids and um, it can cause them to have this adrenal insufficiency, right? Because their body is used to having cortisol just kind of made for them, and um, then all of a sudden it's gone, and they're not able to regulate that themselves. Um, okay. So this case is a little bit, or one that would be a little bit interesting. So you got a 33-year-old P4, G4 woman, uh, three three weeks postpartum, calling for increased weakness and depression. Her delivery was complicated by significant hemorrhage. Uh, she had uh, multiple rounds of blood transfusions, and she was in the ICU for a little bit from hemorrhagic shock. Since delivery, she has not lactated. She has not had a menstrual cycle, and uh, she hasn't really had the energy to do anything at all, um, like get out and go on a walk or exercise like she had uh, before him. You get there to her, heart rate's 90, blood pressure's 95 over 60, respiratory rate's 18, and um, O2 sat's 100%. This is a tough diagnosis, but this lady is weak. She's got, she's tired, she's depressed. Um, she's got blood pressure that's 95 over 60. She had this delivery that had a massive, that had a lot of bleeding, required a lot of blood transfusion. And then now she's also got um, this problem lactating, right? So the problem lactating kind of makes me think that we've got a problem within the brain that she's not stimulating um, the, the hormone needed in order to be able to stimulate um, uh, lactation after pregnancy. So this lady could be suffering from the secondary adrenal insufficiency, something called Sheehan syndrome, right? Where you have a, a basically a pituitary gland necrosis, right? It, it, hasn't gotten blood or it, it had such decreased blood flow during that time of shock to where that now um, the pituitary gland has died and it's not producing the, the stimulating hormones that it normally does. So these patients can, um, uh, can present with adrenal insufficiency as well. This is one that would be a little bit more alarming. So we got a 22 year old female um, call for decreased mental status and lethargy. You get to her college dorm, uh, you see a young female slumped over on the couch, minimally responsive, uh, not probably minimally responsible too. Um, and she has poor skin turgor. She feels warm. Her neck is stiff. And again, she's warm. Um, heart rate of 120, blood pressure of 90 over 50. Uh, and remaining is normal. What are we thinking in this lady? But number one concern. Shocky, right? Sepsis. She feels warm. Take a temp, and she's 103. You, you uh, uh, get her moved over. She's in shorts, and you see her knees, and they look, look like that. Does that concern you at all? You may know what that's called. That what that what type of rash that that is. I think I hear a rumor of uh, purpura in the back. So it's a purpuric rash, right? Now the lead up question or the follow up question to that is what causes that? 
<laughs> could be adrenal hemorrhage. Yeah, which then causes. Um, so you get this is something called meningococcal anemia, right? This is disseminated um, Neisseria infection. Um, what what causes this specific uh, rash is severe thrombocytopenia, right? So somebody that has a very low platelet level um, as a function of this disease, and you get this this kind of weird purpuric looking rash. Also seen in something called HENOC um, or HSP HENOC, whatever uh, purpura is a childhood uh, childhood disease mostly. This is one that should really concern you. These patients are extremely sick and have a very uh, has a very high mortality rate. Um, it is also very highly infectious um, and may require you to have some sort of um, uh, prophylactic treatment if you encounter a patient uh, with this. Generally, if we're just transporting these patients and not doing any invasive procedures, then it's fine. But for the most part, anybody that is living in close close relation uh, with these with these patients, um, or anybody who has exchanged bodily fluids, however that may be, um, and then anybody that has performed um, uh, invasive procedures such as intubation, uh, may need prophylactic treatment um, uh, for this disease. Again, it's caused by Neisseria uh, meningitis. It is a gram-negative diplococci. Uh, which is not something, it's the most common um, cause of bacterial meningitis in children nowadays, now that we have vaccines for um, haemophilus and pneumococcal vaccines. It's seen in a bimodal distribution, meaning that it, there's a peak um, in children that are less than two, and then it kind of goes away for a while, and then there's another large peak in, um, in kids and young adults uh, from the ages of 16 to 21, generally seen in areas of close quarters uh, of college dorms, uh, military um, uh, uh, dorms as well, daycares, things of that sort. So you'll see that purpuric rash from severe thrombocytopenia. These patients can develop DIC um, uh, from, from sepsis um, and can basically just be bleeding from all orifices at that point, uh, which is a terrifying thing to see. And it's associated with this waterhouse Friedrichsen syndrome or the adrenal hemorrhage, right? Um, and it's caused by caused by infection, one of those infectious causes of uh, primary adrenal insufficiency. OK, we're done with the endocrine portion. Any questions, comments, concerns on the endocrine stuff so far? I know, thrilling topics. Again, so a lot of these is you kind of have to have a high level of suspicion. And then a lot of times we're not going to be able to diagnose these until we get labs back, right? Like I'm not going to be able to tell you pre-hospital that someone has hyponatremia, right? I can think it um, and kind of figure or maybe kind of lead. There's some things that can lead me toward that, but I'm not going to be able to diagnose a lot of these things uh, beforehand, but at least having it on your radar and knowing like, oh, I need to uh, remember to tell others about these things or what I've seen or um, especially back in DKA, um, you know, getting some treatment started or know not to give insulin um, unless you have some information around. All right, so this is a this is a patient I had um, the other day. Anybody want to interpret this EKG for me? There's going to be more, so don't don't everybody jump at once. You all you'll you'll get a shot. Is anybody, I guess, first of all, is anybody scared of the CKGs? Is this, would this make you worried? Okay, I would agree with that. I would agree that I, I got this, uh, I got this EKG at 2 a.m. on a night shift. Um, I saw it, signed it, looked at it, and I was like, ah, I think for the most part it's okay. The only thing that made me a little bit concerned or made me think, made me look at it a second time was I got some weird like T wave inversion here and along and, and leads two and leads three um, for those on camera that I can't see me pointing. Right. So you got a little bit of funkiness going on, uh, but nothing that would make me call a cardiologist and send the CKG over. Right. Um, an hour later, I get. The first lab, uh, the lab back, and his troponin level is 143. Um, for those that don't know, we use the high sensitivity troponins uh, at UAB, and the the low end uh, or the the normal 
is generally less than six, right? The 99th percentile for men is uh, less than less than nine. So 143 is pretty high. It can be elevated for a number of different reasons, not related to the heart. But uh, this guy was 45 years old, generally healthy, and the previous troponin that I got on him back in um, um, back or that we had gotten on him in September was seven. So this is abnormal, right? So I got a second EKG at that time. What's different about this one than this one? I guess grossly, I ask you the same question. Is, does this make you nervous? Yeah. So his heart rate's a little slower. And remember those inversions that we saw? Back in, so the inversions here, it's it's a different layout, so it's a little confusing, but there's a lead one, two, and three, right? And then leads one, two, and three up here. So they're a little bit more impressive, right? I don't, I still don't have any ST elevation. I still don't have anything that's making me say, I have to activate the cath lab right this second, right? But there's more there that's telling me like, there's a weird, there's something weird going on here. And it's in a specific pattern, right? Leads two three AVF, which are which type of leads? Inferior leads. So it's all within the same area, right? Which makes me a, a little bit more concerned. And this is an hour after his first EKG. And the guy still has chest pain. Okay. He finally gets back to a room uh, of how things are, right? I get another EKG because he still has chest pain. This is 45 minutes after this one. Right. Now, what do we think? Does this scare you? Please, God, say yes. Right. And it scares you because of why. Two, three, and AVF have massive ST elevations. Right. He's got a STEMI. Right. So this is this is just to show that an EKG in itself, by itself, doesn't mean a thing in the right in the in the right clinical context. Right. If there's somebody that has has some weirdness going on. He's got persistent chest pain and the story's right. Don't ever be afraid to get another EKG, all right? If y'all get if y'all get one on scene and in route the patient's chest pain is, is persistent and worsening, get another, right? Things change. This is an actual progression of someone developing a, a STEMI, right? So he gets, he goes to the cath lab, this is his cath report here. So you see, um, this is the where the occlusion is in the in the RCA, which is runs in the inferior pattern of the heart. It has 90% stenosis. He come over here. They put in a little balloon and blow it up, and now he's got flow back and everything's fine. He was discharged just a couple days later. It's kind of neat to see. This lady came in a couple days ago. And uh, she came in for the sniffles, really. And sniffles and cold. She's a bedbound paraplegic. Um, had a has had a cabbage and now has a leadless pacemaker. Um, but she says she's just kind of been coughing more frequently, been tired, and um, uh, just doesn't doesn't feel right. She thinks she's overloaded. She hasn't been taking her water pills. What's going on with this EKG? Or what's kind of what's funky about it? Yeah, it's weird, right? Um, and so, like, why why is this why is this the way it is? So, when I when I see something like this, I've got to got to take a second look, right? We see like a wide QRS, and at that point, I got uh, whenever I see a wide QRS, I got to think like, what what am I actually looking at here? So, what are these what are these little things here? So, those are pacer spikes, right? So, this is if I see a pacer spike, and then I see a wide QRS, that makes me think this is a ventricularly paced person, right? This is a normal native beat. Right, so I've got a, a P wave here, a narrow QRS, and then what seems like maybe a long um, QT segment here, right? But that's that. This is her native beat. If we go down here, then I see her. Her pacer says it's taking too long. I'm gonna fire. And then this one it looks kind of mixed. You have a native beat mixed in the middle of this, so her heart's just doing it on its own here. And then I've got my pacer again, native pacer pacer. 
right? So this is kind of intermittent. Um, she's being intermittently paced, basically. But nothing on here that makes me think that anything crazy funky is is going on, honestly, other than maybe the QRS is a little bit wider than what I, I would reg regularly think. We get her labs back and her. we get a call from the lab that says her potassium is 7.0 um, and no hemolysis at all. Um, I repeated the EKG at that point, and now she's gotten to this point. What's different about this one than that one? Right, absolutely. So this is completely being, this is only uh, her being paced, right? And so that that leads me to say that her potassium is so high, her heart is not functioning. And the only thing that's keeping her alive right now is her pacer, right? And so we do all of the hypo, uh, hyperkalemic treatments. She gets two grams of mag. She gets insulin and glucose. Um, she gets um, Locelma, all the all the jazz, right? Um, she this lady needs emergent dialysis. Well, she refuses dialysis, and it was a whole ordeal. Um, but um, we ended up trying to do some other management. Um, even after all of those meds that we gave, she still her heart rate is exactly 50, um, which is her pacemaker backup setting. Um, at that point, I gave her another two grams of calcium along with an albuterol in treatment, um, a continuous albuterol treatment, and then her heart rate slowly increased, and this was her heart rate after all of that treatment um, uh, came about, right? So now she's back to a normal sinus rhythm. Um, she was at a rate of around 65, yeah, with absolutely no pacing, right? Um, and she also gotten LASIX and all that stuff too, right? So this is kind of important. The important thing to know about, about this though is that it looks better, but she's not really better, right? All the things that we do uh, really from um, from pre-hospital and in the emergency, uh, the emergency department is kind of shifting that, uh, shifting that potassium around and allowing the heart to function until we can actually get rid of the, get rid of the potassium, either by diuresis, diarrhea, or dialysis. All right, or three Ds. Questions, comments, concerns about anything at all? Yo. Hey, Doc, yes, yeah, so we had one person ask, so you, which of the therapies for this patient would you prioritize? I'm assuming calcium. But. Yeah, if you've got EKG changes or any evidence of cardiac dysfunction, calcium's first, right? Um, and that helps stabilize the cardiac membrane. So yeah, definitely calcium. So we also had a question texted. Um, what What is the ability of the ED where you work to get someone emergent dialysis? Depends on where you're at um, and depends on how um, excited a nephrologist is to wake up at one o'clock in the morning to do emergent dialysis, um, which generally is not. Um, should It should be, and it really kind of depends on the clinical picture too. Some of these patients, this lady needed it because her creatinine was also 7.5, right? Some patients that have, uh, there was a new onset kidney failure. So some patients that have hyperkalemia, that's like a 6.3 or maybe even, you know, somewhere in the low sixes um, and have a reasonable kidney function are still making urine. A lot of times we can temporize those people. We can keep giving them all these medications, give them a ton of diuretics, um, put them on a Bumex strip or a Lasix strip or something of that sort, and then start the localma. A day or two later, their potassium has started to normalize and we can save them from getting on dialysis. It really depends on kind of the clinical uh, clinical picture of this lady is also in acute renal failure and she made 50 milliliters of urine um, on a Bumex strip in uh, seven hours. So she's probably not going to thrive. Okay, got two more while you're answering that one. Um, so in the PACE type K patient, the reason uh, we can't see the sine wave is due to the ventricular pacer. Yeah, yeah. So somehow her pacer is still able to able to function, and you're not actually able to see what the heart's doing. I would expect her to be like in a complete heart block or really just kind of uh, no activity at that point. It, Seven, it's a sine wave type pattern. Yeah, yeah. So I think the question about the how quickly can you get dialysis stems from an experience a lot of pre-hospital providers have where you get called to a dialysis center mm -hmm. 
the patient showing signs and symptoms of hyper K haven't started dialysis yet, but because they're quote not acting right, that dialysis center wants to ship them to the ED. So a lot of times for us, we think, you know, hey, it'd probably be better for the patient to go ahead and get dialysis while they're here. But it's hard to explain that sometimes to the dialysis center. So get You're medical control wrong. involved. Is that would that be your advice? Uh, I mean, yeah, at the end of the day, we can't keep them from sending them. Um, and that's what we're going to do and in the ED. And it's just as frustrating to say, yeah, they need dialysis. Um, Brian Labs, they can't work things out, but you can in the emergency room. I and mean, could this be a non dialysis related emergency that's going on with the patient? Sure. Um, and I think they just feel uncomfortable saying, hey, they're having like, oh, this is all dialysis related. And is it? Most of the time, yes, it is. And they come to us, we work them up, like, oh, hey, you need to do dialysis. But you can't always be 100% sure of that in the pre hospital setting. And I think that's part of why you don't get called. Excuse me, quite a bit. Last thing I wanted to mention of why DKA people are scared to intubate and why people that are in a severe acidosis are scared to intubate. Um, mostly in the in the situation of RSI. Obviously, if they code or they quit breathing, they need to be intubated. There's nothing we can do about it, right? But to decide to RSI these patients is a very, very, very big decision and one that could absolutely kill the patient if we do it. They're very, very acidotic, right? That's why they're doing this big Kussmaul breathing and they're trying to get all the uh, all the CO2 out. And generally, our own bodies are much better at regulating the acidosis than, than we are as physicians, respiratory therapists, pre-hospital providers, whatever it may be. What happens when you push succinylcholine or rocuronium in these patients? Stop breathing. So then what also help what also happens? Right. Yep. So they've already got this buildup of acid from, you know, these ketones, and then you take away their compensatory mechanism of, of breathing. Now they have a buildup of CO2. You worsen their acidosis, and um, and they go into severe like cardiogenic collapse essentially, um, and can die quickly. So um, then you put them on the vent. Uh, managing them on the ventilator is also very complicated in that they're breathing 30 times a minute. You need to match that. You need to match whatever their minute ventilation was. Um, at that time. So you may, when I put this person on the vent, I may set the rate at 30 in order to be able to get them up to whatever I need to do. Sometimes I would start, I would put these patients on BiPAP just to be able to get the readings off the BiPAP machine to know what their minute ventilation was so that if I did intubate them, I, I put them at that, at, at those settings. Um, before I'm intubating a DKA patient, I may push an amp of uh, an amp of bicarb. There's no great literature behind it, but it might help get me kind of that, you know, 10 second uh, paralytic um, uh, uh, time period. And then I'm going to have my code cart ready. I'm going to have push toast pressers and everything else needed um, uh, to intubate this person. So again, not really the, the purpose of this lecture. Um, and really not the purpose of uh, most pre-hospital care at this point, but as RSIs may become more common, just know that um, uh, this is something that should be put a lot, a lot of thought in. Sweet, break. All right, hi everybody. Welcome back. I'm Dr. Melissa Willett Caldwell, uh, also one of the emergency medicine doctors and EMS fellows at UAB, along with Dr. Davidson, who just gave a very sexy lecture on endocrine emergencies. Um, so we're gonna switch topics and we're gonna talk about CNS injuries. Um, this lecture was very generously donated by Dr. Julie Brown, last year's EMS fellow. Um, I have gone through it and changed some things, uh, but she certainly deserves credit for donating this to me. Um, yeah, move over slightly. I don't mind at all. You want to see my face better? All right, all right. Fair enough. Okay. 
Okay, so um, CNS injuries is a very large topic, right? So this is going to mostly talk about blunt head trauma. Um, I mean, I guess it could be skull fractures and some penetrating trauma, but mostly blunt head trauma. We are not going to cover um, like penetrating injuries to the spine or really any spinal injuries. We will talk briefly about C-spine immobilization and blunt trauma, um, but that's not really the focus of the uh, talk today. But if you guys have questions, of course, go ahead and ask anything you'd like. Um, so we'll start just by kind of talking about a case, a 30-year-old female, a line unresponsive on the ground. It's obviously an MVC. Um, she, her, her car looks absolutely totaled. Um, she's obviously had in facial trauma. Um, so that'll be the context in which we go forward. So the outline today um, is going to be some definitions about what um, traumatic brain injury is, um, some statistics about it, um, signs, symptoms, what we expect to see with mild, moderate, severe TBIs, um, some of the pathophys about what happens to the brain after it sustains a traumatic insult, and some of the secondary injuries that um, we work really hard to prevent, a lot of which um, happens in minutes to hours, sometimes days, and we'll kind of talk about some of the long-term consequences of it, but certainly we'll focus on what y'all can do to help prevent secondary injury um, um, in the first um, time on scene and during transport. And then we'll talk about classification, like how we classify these injuries, primary secondary evaluation. We will touch on C-spine immobilization, but again, it's not the focus of the talk today. Um, treatment provided, um, and then there'll be some opportunity for questions if you guys have it. So traumatic brain injury, right? So the definition is an alteration in brain function or other evidence of brain pathology caused by some sort of external force, right? So this can be blunt impact, this can be penetrating trauma, this could be from a blast wave where there may not be any evidence of external trauma, um, and accelerating, decelerating forces. Like that's the coup, contra coup injuries that we talk about. And again, that also may not have any external signs of trauma, but these patients may be altered or have other neurologic deficits. So statistics, the global burden of TBI is challenging, right? So many patients, particularly those with mild injuries, sometimes don't even seek care or they go to an urgent care um, or a place where we're not collecting this data. Um, but from 2014, um, 2.5 million ED visits, that's a lot. Um, how about a quarter of a million hospitalizations, um, about 60,000 deaths. And right, this doesn't include patients that did not seek medical attention. They received ambulatory care. They were seen at VA centers or they were military patients, right? So that's a lot of um, statistics that are lost. So this is probably underestimating the true burden of this disease. Um, so causes, number one is falls. Right. So you guys go on a lot of runs for falls. Right. Um, also, MDCs, certainly. Um, hey, can I ask you, Wes, can I put this in presenter view on the screen? Do you know how to do that? Because I have stuff in the like notes section that I would love to look at as I talk if you can't do it. Yeah. Ow. Well, never mind then. Never mind then. OK, um, so again, falls, traffic incidents, um, people who just sustained got hit in the head by something. Um, you know, assaults, uh, other and unknown, which um, are a smaller percentage. So, um, MBC is a, so in my little presenter notes, it was saying which ones were on the rise, and of course now I can't remember which ones those were. But I think MBC is increasing, falls are increasing, assault and self harm is also increasing. Um, so older adults, they have the highest morbidity and mortality. This makes sense because they're kind of just medically more fragile folks. Um, also, um, as you get older, you get brain atrophy. Um, your brain shrinks and there's just more opportunity for damage there when it um, uh, encounters, um, you know, some sort of traumatic event. Um, they just in general have higher ED visits, hospitalizations and deaths. Um, and then higher rates of ED visits in the, the young and then uh, people ages 50 to 24, they're just the prime. That's the prime trauma time of your life when you're out there making not the best choices. Um, other risk factors associated with traumatic head injury are lower socioeconomic status, alcohol and drug use, underlying psychiatric and cognitive disorders. Um, so signs and symptoms, and I think these are none of these are new to anybody, uh, but these are immediate signs, right? So if you sustain a traumatic brain injury, um, you might be altered, right? And this can be just irritable. Um, 
uh, anxious. Someone who's just not acting like themselves. They can be restless, but they also can have decreased mentation, right? So people who are lethargic and obtunded, those are certainly concerning. Um, headache, vomiting, any kind of weakness or sensory changes, focal neurologic deficit, and then late sign findings like on vital signs are um, like the Cushing's triad, right? So the um, hypertension and the bradycardia, and then certainly um, patients, it can depress their drive to breathe, right? And so we may need to intervene there. Um, and then of course, signs of herniation. So the most common one that we talk about is the uncle herniation, um, which is where part of the temporal lobe starts to herniate down. Um, and that's where you get the fixed blown pupil. Um, they certainly have respiratory issues um, that Cheyenne Stokes respirations and kind of irregular, fast, shallow breathing. Um, and then, um, there are certain brainstem reflexes that you guys, I don't necessarily expect you guys to be testing in the um, pre-hospital setting, but there's a thing called doll's eyes where you turn the head rapidly or put cold water in the ear and you, there's a certain pupillary or ocular motor response that you would expect. Um, and then the Babinski reflex. Um, so if you run something kind of sharp, even just a nail on someone's foot, you expect um, like an upgoing toe. Um, so if if it does not do what it is expected, then that is obviously abnormal and that has to do with um, either something peripheral, but mostly central. Um, and then any kind of abnormal posturing is very bad. Um, so there's um, decorticate and decerebrate posturing. And if they're extended, that is worse. Um, and then these are long term signs and symptoms of traumatic brain injury. So Patients who sustain a moderate to severe injury can have really long-term effects that affect their functioning, right? Um, of course, they may have problems with their ADL, speech and language, but um, they may have long-term headaches and nausea and vomiting, balance issues, um, uh, mental fogginess, trouble remembering, concentrating, trouble with interpersonal relations and um, interacting with others. They can have emotional issues, sleep issues. So pathophys, right? So of course, when you get the primary insult, so you get struck in the head or something hits you in the head, some sort of, uh, you get skull lacerations, skull fractures, maybe that's just say scalp lacerations, skull fractures, contusions, um, damage to the brain parenchyma itself, right? Uh, by um, bleeding. And then you can get something called diffuse axonal injury. And we'll talk a little bit about each of those things as we go on. Um, but the secondary injury, um, so primary injury is done. Nothing we can do about that by the time we get on scene. But preventing further secondary injury is really important. So um, the main, and again, we'll talk about this more in depth, but the main thing is avoiding low blood pressure and low O2 sats, right? So um, the carbon dioxide content um, in the blood has a lot to do with vasoconstriction in the brain, okay? Um, and when you vasoconstrict, you get reduced blood flow. This can cause further ischemia to the brain um, and further insult. Um, this also causes releases of um, certain neurotransmitters and amino acids that um, will also cause further damage to the brain um, and metabolic insults such as uh, mitochondrial toxicity um, and death to brain cells. And um, those are all really, really bad things, right? So. Um, we want to work hard to minimize those in the minutes and hours and up to days, depending on how severe the injury is. Um, so this is a critical aspect of secondary, of avoiding secondary brain injury, right? Additional insults, like I was just talking about. So hypotension and hypoxia decreases substrate delivery of oxygen and glucose. Um, fever and seizures are quite common. Um, there's a phenomenon called neurostorming. I don't know if everyone's ever heard about that, but we'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, you can get, you know, some of these things elevate the intracranial pressure. Um, and when you elevate the pressure, it impinges upon the vasculature. You get decreased blood and thus oxygen causing further insults. Um, and then having derangements of your blood sugar can also cause a lot of problems. All right, so this is a heterogeneous disease. Right. This is there's a lot of different things that uh, um, that can lead to a traumatic brain injury, um, and we classify this in a lot of different ways. One is severity, and that's based on GCS, right? Um, but also the mechanism or type of injury, closed head injury, penetrating trauma, things like that. 
Um, but also the pathophys, uh, meaning exactly what is going on within the skull, right? What damage has happened. Um, age and comorbidities certainly play a role in the severity of injury that happens. So when we talk about severity, we use GCS, right? Um, there are things that confound this, right? So if this person's intoxicated and they fell or got into a car accident, um, intoxication of whatever substance they're using is, is going to muddy the waters, right? Um, if they have to be intubated, they've probably gotten medications to facilitate that. That's also going to mess it up. Paralysis certainly will. Um, and any kind of sedating medications that may be provided. Um, but we tend to classify it as a mild is a GCS 13 to 15, moderate 9 to 12, severe 8 or less, right? And then when you get to that point, um, we're really thinking, do we need to support this person's airway? What do we need to do in the pre-hospital setting to avoid those secondary insults? So um, Glasgow Coma Scale, we all know this. Um, I remember be working in the trauma bay at UAB. And if you guys know Michael Lovelace, he's one of the nurses. And um, the junior in the bay, I was an intern with baby doc at the time. And your job is to do the primary survey. And so you're you know, calling out ABCs. And then you have to call out pupil size and calculated GCS. And any time I said anything less than 15, he would say, then this isn't a busy trauma, right? He'd be like, well, what'd you want? knock the number off for? And I'd be trying in my head to figure out like crunch numbers and what. And he was just trying to call me out and make me feel like an idiot because he's a funny guy. But um, we all should, for the most part, have this down pat. This is something we're calculating on most of our patients. And sometimes it's kind of a gross. I mean, if they're alert and talking to you, you're like, okay, you know, I know it's greater than eight. It can be a gross assessment. But for traumatic, traumatic brain injuries, you really, um, you know, calculating the accurate number does matter because as things change, you can compare it, right? So um, you can read it on the, on the screen and you guys probably know this pretty well. There's also a pediatric Glasgow Coma Scale for young children. Um, it's pretty much the same as the adult, but for an infant, right, who it, uh, does not talk like a normal adult, um, it is a little bit different. So I just put that on there just for comparison so people are aware. Um, and then the motor response, um, you know, the eyes and the verbal are pretty easy to remember, but this is kind of a visual representation of how um, you would calculate motor. So back to our girl. Um, she was your unresponsive status post MBC with obvious head and facial trauma. So we'll calculate her GCS. Um, so her eyes are not opening when you speak to her. So she, um, or when a painful stimulus is applied. So for eyes, she gets a one, right? Because it can't ever be zero. So three is the lowest GCS you can ever get, right? So she'll be one for eyes. She's moaning. So that's incomprehensible sounds, right? Two, yeah. All right. Um, and then so she moves her right hand away when her fingers grabbed. So she's technically withdrawing, right? So she's three and she gets four for that. So she's a seven, right? She's pretty sick. OK, so good job. GCS seven. All right. So now let's go on to talk about different types of injuries, right? Um, so these require neuroimaging. This is not something you will ever know in the pre-hospital setting. You're not going to be able to look at a patient and go, oh, that's a subdural, right? Um, but you can look at a patient and go, ah, they're probably bleeding into their brain. This is dangerous. They got to go. But we'll talk a little bit about it just so y'all know. Um, skull fractures, which is what the arrow sign you're seeing um, up on that um, CT scan is. And we tend to do non-contrasted CTs, um, at least initially, and certainly in trauma because blood lights up bright white. It's very easy to see, okay? Um, so we'll talk about epidural hematomas, subdural hematomas, subarachnoid hemorrhages, um, cerebral contusions, uh, which are just bruises of the brain parenchyma, um, intraventricular hemorrhage, and then DAI, or diffuse axonal injury. So just a little bit of anatomy. Um, so you have your skull, which of course is overlying, or just under your skin. Um, then you have your meninges, which are three different layers. You have the dura, which is a really tough, kind of white fibrous matter. Um, you have the arachnoid space, which is kind of web-like, um, looks like cobwebs. Um, that's what, there's a lot of fluid in that space that kind of acts as a, um, uh shock absorber i guess you can think of um, and then there's blood vessels that run through that 
Um, there are blood vessels that run through each layer and above each layer. So it's not that they're just in the arachnoid space, but a lot of them are. And then the pia is a thin layer that's kind of delicate and is very adherent to the brain. And then underneath that is your brain. So first we'll talk about an epidural hematoma. So epi meaning above, dural meaning the dura. So this is where blood collects in between the skull and the first layer of the meninges, okay? Um, torn, excuse me, torn dural vessels is the cause. This is almost always associated with a skull fracture um, and commonly it is injury to the middle meningeal artery, which is kind of highlighted in that bottom picture. Um, so the classic is, uh, I don't know, guy's out golfing and he gets hit right here in his temple with, with a golf ball or someone's swinging a bat and they get hit right in the side of their head. Um, it's the temporal or temporal parietal region. Um, these folks commonly are described to have a lucid interval. So they got hit in the head, they pass out, um, and then they kind of wake up and they seem like they're like, oh, my head hurts, oh, I'm doing okay. And then they, and then they crump on you. Um, it's not always that story, but that's classically how it's described. And certainly in any board exam, that's what you'll get. Um, and so epidural hematoma is lenticular or lens shaped bleed, okay? Um, so it's like that convex, like half circle that you can see that up there with the arrow sign and that top picture of that CT. Um, this can cross suture lines. So you have a fault, which is if you look, if you're looking at the head CT at the very bottom, so the, I guess, six o'clock position, um, it, there's a falx right there. And because it's above the dura, it can cross that line, okay? Where a subdural will not be able to do that. All right, so subdural hematomas. These are commonly acceleration, deceleration uh, injuries. These are damage to or shearing of these bridging veins. This is crescent shaped, so the opposite of an epidural. Blood collects between the dura and that arachnoid space. Um, so this will be, um, it will hit the falx and won't be able to cross that suture line. Um, these can be acute or chronic. So um, sometimes you'll encounter an old person and then maybe they hit their head a couple of days ago or, um, you know, a week ago and they've had kind of a slow decline, but like, oh, like the last few days, Mima has been really confused, like not good. Um, so Chronic um, subdurals look a little bit different on imaging. So acute blood lights up bright white. As it starts to congeal a little bit, it'll get gray and darker. Um, so sometimes we'll, we will use contrast because you can see the older blood a little bit better. Um, so if it's acute though, um, this patient might be unconscious, right? Um, but know that they, these patients can present with just confusion and altered mental status. Um, this tends to happen more in older adults, alcoholics, um, because they have more cerebral atrophy. And so when that brain moves around during a trauma and it's kind of tearing or shearing those bridging veins, okay? Um, it causes stretching of the bridging veins and they're just more susceptible to damage. That line in the, um, in the neuroimaging at that head CT, that's indicating shift. You might hear the term midline shift, um, which is something that just kind of denotes the severity of the bleed um, and the severity of um, impingement on brain tissue, right? So there's so much um, space occupying blood in there that's literally pushing the brain tissue across the midline. Things that will prompt your neuro, your friendly neighborhood neurosurgeon to intervene surgically are um, the size of the bleed, if there's shift, the degree of neurologic deficit, things like that. So that's why we pay attention to that stuff. Um, so this is just kind of a cartoon that, um, or a drawing that kind of shows the difference between the epidural and the subdural. Um, and that's the falks there in the middle that I was kind of talking about, that green line, um, the falx cerebri in the middle. Um, all right, so we'll talk a little about subarachnoid hemorrhages. So these might not be traumatic. They can be traumatic. And if they are, they're often associated with other types of intracranial bleeding, but not always. Um, so this is disruption of the, the vessels within the pia or rupture of an aneurysm, which is much more common. So these are patients that um, they describe like a thunderclap headache. So again, I included it because it can be traumatic, but 
more often it's not. This is going to be your headache patient. Um, a thunderclap headache, can anyone tell me what that I mean when I say a thunderclap headache? Have you ever heard that term? No, okay. So a thunderclap is like just that, boom. Like it is the worst headache of my life and maximum intensity at onset. So to a lot of times when patients have headaches, they're like, oh, I have a headache. When did it start? Oh, four hours ago. When is it the worst? Did it just, is it getting worse of as far as they go? Yeah, you know, it started four hours ago, but now it's just terrible. That is not a thunderclap. A thunderclap headache is, oh my God, as soon as it hit, I thought, I, my head was going to explode. Maximum intensity, 20 out of 10, right when it started. Um, and that is suspicious for um, an aneurysmal bleed. Um, so risk factors for this, there's a lot of genetic things that can cause it. Well, I guess maybe not a lot, but there's some. Um, so PCKD is polycystic kidney disease. They develop berry aneurysms that are prone to rupture. Um, Igor Danlos folks can also have them. Um, other risk factors are hypertension, smoking, alcohol, and cocaine use. And just the older you are, the more likely you are to form aneurysms. Um, so you can see the white blood and the arrow sign on that neuroimaging kind of around um, the cisterns there. So we use decision-making rules, and I'm kind of going off into the realm of headache and less traumatic brain injury, but I think it's worth mentioning. Um, we have this Ottawa headache rule, subarachnoid rule. It's not val externally validated, so you have to kind of be careful with it, but and you, it does not apply to trauma patients, but that's kind of how we think about who gets imaging and who doesn't. Um, so if you ever were curious, you could look that up. Oh, well, here we go, or we can talk about it now. Um, so these rules are age less than 40, no neck pain or stiffness, which is commonly described in some arachnoid hemorrhages. Um, no witness loss of consciousness, no onset during exertion, no thunderclap type headache, um, and they have to have full range of motion when um, on physical exam, right? So you can safely exclude a subarachnoid if all the above are true and in the right population, which would not be a trauma patient, okay? This isn't for use in people younger than 15, no trauma, people who have like these recurrent chronic headaches. And there was another thing that I had written in my notes, but I can't see, so. All right, cerebral contusions. So this is really just a brain bruise and you can see it in um, kind of the frontal region on those pictures there. Um, frontal and temporal regions are the most susceptible. These are often associated with other types of brain bleeds. Um, and this is just bleeding of small vessels that are within the parenchyma themselves. Um, and then diffuse axonal injury, so DAI. This is, these tend to be like really severe injuries. Um, and this, it's described as the junction of the gray white matter. Um, and so this, I'll flip back to that in one second, but this kind of gives you a little information about like what, what is the gray matter? What is the white matter? And so that's a neuronal cell body, that kind of dendritic looking thing. Um, and then I just put a little things about more about the anatomy and kind of how they're organized in the brain. So your brain parenchyma is made up of billions of these things. Um, and so the cell body, which is what generates the um, chemical or the electrical impulse, um, that is the cell body and that makes up the gray matter. The white matter is gonna be kind of the axon and the nerve endings. All right, let's go back to this. So um, this is a shearing force injury. These tend to be really severe. Um, you know, these, these patients are often totally obtunded. They're really, really sick. You often see other types of brain bleeds and injuries associated with it. Um, but these patients fail to recover as expected. If you have a patient that seems neurologically devastated, that has a terrible neuro exam, that is totally obtunded, that clearly needs to be like intubated um, and, and supported aggressively, but then you get a head CT and you're like, oh, I don't see any bleeding, you need to suspect DAI. Um, so MRI is gonna be more sensitive, um, but even then it can be hard to see. So that little arrow sign is showing a small area of bleeding, right? So if this patient was totally obtunded, like GCS3, got intubated, is doing nothing, but that's what their scan showed, just having these little areas of hyperattenuation um, plus that terrible neurologic exam is um, suggestive of this. That patient's not going to have a good Okay, and we already kind of talked about the anatomy of um, neurons and how it looks when you group them together in the brain. 
And this is intraventricular hemorrhage. So this is bleeding inside the ventricles. And the ventricles are spaces in the brain with um, CA, um, CSF, so cerebral spinal fluid flows, right? So there's a part of your brain that creates the cerebral spinal fluid, um, and then it kind of flows through the brain, through, obeys your spinal cord, right? And your body's constantly making it and absorbing it. Um, and so if you get bleeding inside that you can see in the ventricles, which you can obviously see right there, along with what looks like um, a contusion next to it, yeah, I guess it would be on your left side if you're looking at the screen. Um, so again, it's, it's most commonly associated with other types of bleeding that just spill into the ventricles. Okay, so you often see it with other types of hemorrhage. Um, this certainly can come from physical trauma, but also like hemorrhagic strokes, uh, bleeding tumor, um, and other more medical, less traumatic things. Premature babies, um, they're very high risk for intraventricular bleeding because they're the part of the brain that makes the CSF um, is often damaged. Um, okay. So review of all these just kind of types, right, and how we classify it. So TBI is any alteration in brain function due to some, excuse me, um, some sort of external force or trauma on the brain. More common in elderly, very young, and um, people um, that are kind of young and making poor choices that lead to traumatic injuries. Um, most commonly due to falls in traffic, collisions, but assaults and um, self-inflicted trauma is unfortunately on the rise. Um, symptoms have a very broad range. Um, so it can just be headache, it can just be vomiting, dizziness, but visual disturbances, altered mental status, focal neurologic deficits. Um, so the primary injury is the insult itself, right? The when they got struck in the head that caused the bleed but there is a lot of secondary injury that is going on in that brain hours to days, right? Minutes to hours to days after it occurs. Um, so we classify based on the GCS or the severity, but also based on neuroimaging that tells us a little bit about exactly what type of bleed and what type of injury we're dealing with. Um, management tends to be similar for all types of bleeding, but there are some subtle differences. Uh, there's more that we're going to talk about. Does anybody have any questions about that before I go forward? Okay. All right. So initial assessment, right? It always begins with AB. Well, it always begins with scene safety, right, for y'all. Uh, but then when you encounter your patient, ABCs, um, do we need to um, restrict the cervical spine? And then the big thing here is disability or D, right? So a really good neuro exam. Um, in the pre-hospital setting is very helpful um, because it will dictate how you manage the patient. And you guys are kind of our eyes and ears. You know, we don't know what happened on scene. You guys are the ones that can describe those things to us, which is helpful. Um, so we'll talk briefly about cervical spine restriction. Um, and this is a controversial topic, right? So there's not a ton of great literature out there to help us decide. There is some joint statements from our neurosurgery colleagues and also um, the Association of EMS and um, Emergency Medicine Providers. And they're all, for the most part, um, in agreement, right? So you need to suspect a cervical spine injury in any patient that has a blunt head injury, right? Or any kind of blunt trauma, okay? Um, patients that have isolated penetrating trauma, um, no secondary blunt trauma, an intact neurologic exam, they typically do not have an unstable spine fracture, okay? But if any of you have been in the UAB trauma bay, if you roll in with any trauma patient who does not have a C spine, does not have a collar on, we tend to stop and put it on them before we transfer. Not always, not always, especially with penetrating trauma. But a good question to ask is if someone say they got shot somewhere, did you fall? Did you hit your head? Right? Because um, if they say, you know, I was running away from someone, I got shot, I tripped, I fell, I smashed my head against the ground, my neck hurts, my back hurts, right? So always consider that there could be a secondary blunt trauma. But for the most part, we do not restrict the spine at all with penetrating trauma. And that's backboards or C-collars. And that is because for a couple reasons. One, if you have any penetrating injury to the spine, whatever damage is done is done, right? Like if that has been transected, no amount of restriction is going to save that or bring that back or do anything. So we're not really helping them. Um, and these patients that have penetrating trauma have a lot of issues with breathing. They have a lot of issues with bleeding. 
Um, and if you are restricting movement, restricting their spine, restricting their neck, um, you can cause more problems in that department. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so should we be clearing cervical collars in the field? I think yes. I trust you guys that you can ask the right question to do a good physical exam um, to determine whether someone needs a caller. Sometimes you don't have that amount of time. Sometimes your patient can't answer your questions, right? And in that case, if patients have blunt trauma, put a caller on them, okay? Um, but the things we ask to clear a caller, your patient cannot be intoxicated. They cannot have any distracting injuries. So that's already a large portion of your trauma patients, right? So that excludes them. Um, they can't have any neck pain, especially midline neck pain. They can't have any neurologic deficits. I have any numbness in my hand, you're getting the collar, you know? Um, and then they have to be, they have to have a GCS of 15, right? You have to trust the things that they're saying. Questions about that? Okay. When in doubt, blunt trauma, put the collar on, okay? We'll clear it at the hospital. So, yep. Doc, that's just for clarification. We've had a couple of people yep. type in. So, difference between just putting a cervical collar on versus full spinal motion restriction with backboard and all that. So, for full um, spinal motion restriction, right now we only do that if there's evidence of paralysis. Is that correct? Yeah. So, if you have any neurologic deficit at all, and that can even be the patient reporting sensory changes, right? Then you do full spinal restriction, okay? Um, but if they have blunt trauma and you can't clear their collar, if you're worried at all, based on kind of the things I just said, at least put the collar on, okay? So things that are dangerous about a cervical collar is um, it restricts, like it's designed to do, it does restrict motion of the, of the neck, right? So um, if this patient needs an airway, that's difficult. We'll talk about that in a second, but also, these collars can restrict the vasculature in the neck. And I've talked a little bit, when we're going to talk a little bit more about secondary injury to the brain um, when they when patients have head trauma. Um, and you can, you can increase the pressure, and they've done studies that show that this is true, that if your collar is too tight or if your neck is not in a relaxed position, it can decrease venous flow from the head and neck. And that in itself can increase pressure in the brain. And that's something we want to avoid in head injury. So I'm kind of saying contradictory things, right? Um, and I'm not intending to be confusing, but it's because these are complex patients and we don't have a lot of good literature to say, this is 100% what we need to do in every situation. But if you think the patient needs immobilization or restriction of their C collar, of their C spine, please do it. But just know that you don't want it so tight if they have any kind of, um, you know, altered mental status, or if you think they have any kind of traumatic brain injury, you need to make sure that neck is in a neutral position, which it should be anyway, if you're um, restricting the spine, but that it's not so, so tight, okay? Which kind of contradicts what the purpose of the restriction is, right? But just know, I think we should be doing it, but just know the limitations and the potential harms of it, right? Okay, so what if, uh, your patient crumps on you and now we got a tube them, okay? Um, so studies show that you actually, if you don't open the front part of that collar and have someone hold that patient's C-spine, you will actually cause more subluxation and more movement of the neck when you intubate. And that's because your view is gonna be so bad, you are cranking on that neck to try to get your view and studies support that you actually move it more, strangely. So. If you're going to do an airway, right, do all of the, um, you know, you want to minimize um, hypoxia, you want to do all the pretreatment, you want to, you know, make sure the airway goes as smoothly as possible. Your most experienced provider should be doing it. RSI, if it's available, all the optimization things that we've talked about in previous lectures that we talk about in skills labs that you guys all know how to do. Um, but you want to make sure you take the anterior part of that collar off and have someone hold C-spine um, because it will you will get a better view, you have more first pass success, and studies show that you're actually gonna move the neck less if you do that, okay? Uh, questions about that? Okay. All right, so um, disability and neurologic evaluation, right? So um, step one is level of consciousness and determining a GCS, right? Um, 
and then assessing pupillary size and reactivity, right? Are they fixed and dilated? Uh, do you have a single blown pupil? Um, and then gross motor function and sensation, right? Squeeze my hands, wiggle your toes. Do you feel me touching you? Basic things like that. All right, and then secondary assessment, right? Inspecting and palpating the bony structures of the head. Watch for pieces of glass, sharp things, right? Um, and the scalp and protect yourself first. Um, noting any signs of, um, like if you feel a depression that could potentially be skull fracture, right? Skull fractures are, um, you know, highly, highly associated with intracranial hemorrhages um, or um, intracranial bleeding. Um, and then um, any kind of deformity, any kind of step off, um, anything that feels like brain tissue, right? Um, note any signs of a basal or skull fracture. And so there's a couple different things. Can anyone tell me? I mean, some are on the screen, but go ahead and tell me what some of those signs are. There's some right up there. You're looking right at them. Anybody? Battle sign, thank you, all right. So <laughs> battle signs is bleeding behind the ear, which looks as bruising. So it's bruising behind the ear, just adjacent to the mastoid. That can take hours to show up. You may not see that right away. You probably won't. Um, raccoon eyes, right, periorbital. Um, it tends to spare the like the eyelid itself, not always. And again, that can take eyes or hours to show up. Hemotympanum is another one, bleeding out the ear. Um, so that can also come from damage to the ear itself, right? Maybe someone's got like a, you know, a laceration in the ear and that's causing it. That's not hemotympanum. Hemotympanum is blood coming through the TM, right? So um, these are signs of... Uh, a fracture kind of in the basal or base of the skull, um, also associated with um, a lot of intracranial hemorrhage. Um, so patients with mild TBA may not have external signs of trauma, or depending on the mechanism of injury, they also may not have external signs of trauma. All right, so these are also some um, just examples of what we just talked about. See how um, the gentleman has, like his eyelids are spared. He doesn't have bruising over the eyelids, so that's common. Um, okay, so we'll talk a little bit about mild TBIs, right? So these are patients, I mean, these are kind of concussions, right? Um, or patients that only have a mild depression in their GCS, right? So it says 24 hours of home or inpatient observation. I would say any if you have the patient a patient who has any kind of traumatic mechanism and there's anything abnormal about them, even though it may be classified as mild and they may get 24 hours of home OBS, these patients need to be evaluated, need to be brought to the emergency department. Um, I will tell you an interesting story. So I work out at Blunt right here, and I work out at St. Clair. Um, and I was at, I think it was it was St. Clair, and I had a, a mother and a girlfriend bring a young man in who was certainly in that, um, I think he was like 19, so in that we do dumb things and we get hurt a lot category. And he was skateboarding without a helmet down a, what sounds like a large hill and just bit it. And he was flying, they said. He landed on his right side and was out. I was unconscious for, you know, I don't know, they said 10 minutes, which is probably unlikely because time moves differently when you're um, when you're um, kind of panicking and these these family members certainly were doing that but he was just like screaming and saying pain everywhere and he was answering all my questions he was moving everything we had road rash everywhere but based on how he was acting I just trauma scanned him because it sounds like a really significant mechanism I put a collar on him I scanned him um, and everything was clean and they threw up like, damn it okay actually they threw up once before CT I gave him some medicine didn't throw up scanned him everything looked clean. I looked through the scan and I got a read and the brain, the, you know, the head CT said normal, he threw up again. And I was like, oh, okay. And he just wasn't acting right. Like I just, I didn't, there was just something about it. Sometimes your spidey sense is just like, oh, I don't like this. He just wasn't acting right. But his scan was clean. He was like, I want to leave, I want to leave, I want to leave. I said, just let me watch you for a little bit, please. Um, and then I got a, a GSW to the head POV that showed up. So we had some, <laughs> it was a rough night. So we had um, some time. Right, which I was like, you can't go anyway because I have no nurses and no one to discharge you. Um, and so I ended up obsing him for a while. He didn't develop any focal neurologic deficits. He was still answering my questions appropriately. He um, didn't throw up again, but I had given him meds. Um, so I ended up letting him go. And I talked to mom. I just said, if anything gets worse, please come back. You know, we had this kind of shared decision making, what we do in the hospital all the time. I documented the heck out of it. Um, and then I didn't work the next few days, but I got a message from one of the nurses that said that kid came back because um, 
he just continued to not act right and they rescanned him and he had a brain bleed. So this technically would have been classified as a mild TBI when I discharged him, right? Like I had no evidence. He was banged up, he was bruised up. You know, I would say his GCS was 14, because I don't know, 14, 15, he was answering everything appropriately, he was alert, he was oriented, but he just seemed confused a little bit to me. I just didn't like it, um, but I did let him go. And it turns out he developed a bleed. So have a very, I, I tell you that story only because it's kind of a crazy story, but also just have a high index of suspicion. These patients, especially young people, they don't want to go to the hospital sometimes, right? Um, like that family made that kid come in, you know? And I got a call on the red phone at St. Clair the other day from an RPS medic who I actually know pretty well. Um, and it was a patient who got hit in the ear or hit in the side of the head with a rock, because I guess that's a fun game to do when you're in your 20s, throw rocks at each other. Um, and he was altered. He just wasn't acting right, but was refusing transport. He had friends with him, no parents, no nothing. I got on, I said, I want to talk to the patient. and he just like wasn't acting right. And I was like, you got to take him in. Like, I'm sorry to make you do this. If you have to call me back for restraints, that's fine. If he can, if he's intoxicated, if he's altered in any way, like I don't, it doesn't matter. Like these patients need to be evaluated. So I only tell you those stories just to say, I'm sure all of you have a story where you've encountered a traumatic injury in a patient who doesn't want to come in. Um, and those are hard decisions to make, right? Because sometimes we have to forcefully take them in and it sucks for you guys to have to do that. Call the police, ask for restraints, things like that. Um, but that young man who I let go home, if his family hadn't brought him back in, who knows what would have happened, you know? He got shipped for neurosurgery evaluation. So you'll, what you guys do really does matter, okay? Um, so outpatient observation, right? And so these are all the things, these are our return precautions. These are all the things that I told that family to look for. And these things, some of these things, I wasn't there when he came back in, so I don't know exactly what changed, but it sounds like his mental status. Um, so if you have a patient who got hit in the head, but they are totally alert and oriented, have capacity, are not intoxicated, have no distraction, distracting injuries, has a totally normal neurologic exam, you feel like they have capacity, you can leave them with someone that is gonna watch them, right? So if you're like, I don't see a reason how I can make you go in, right? These are the things you need to talk to them about. You guys talk about return precautions. Call 911 again, precautions, okay? Um, because these, it can be a delayed presentation, okay? But I would still convince them as much as you can to come get evaluated. All right, so even with mild TBIs, people can have seizures. Um, if your patient seizes, please treat them accordingly, right? So give those benzos, whatever you need to do in route, right? Put end title on them. If you have to take their airway, do it. Um, because seizures increase the metabolic demand of an already damaged brain. We do not want these patients to seize, okay? Um, it increases the pressure within the brain as well. Also bad news bears for these guys. Um, so please do treat if they start to seize, whatever you need to do and you know how to do it. Um, and then they obviously will get transported. Um, and there's something else I want to say about seizure. Maybe it'll come back to me. Um, so mild TBI, um, return to school work, right? So if I work somebody up and I let them go and I go, ah, you probably have a concussion. We used to do this thing where we said, don't let them fall asleep, right? Don't let them fall asleep, right? They're going to die. We don't do that anymore. We actually say the opposite now. We want them to have brain rest, right? So we want them to be in a quiet, dark room, minimize screens, minimize anything, excuse me, that is activating to the brain. Um, they certainly... Um, should go on to make a full recovery. Um, they don't always, right? Sometimes they have persistent symptoms that are permanent and um, upsetting to patients. Um, but they certainly should not be playing sports again or anything like that until they've either been cleared by a neurologist or their symptoms completely resolve. All right, so now let's talk about the sick ones. All right, so these are the people that have um, depressed GCS. They're obviously ill. They have very significant mechanisms of injury. Um, so the two things you guys can do, guys and gals, can do is um, prevention of hypotension, prevention of hypoxia, um, because we know that these patients have poorer outcomes when we let these things happen, okay? Um, so specifically, you should be targeting SpO2s greater than 90. 92 is what we say the low limit of normal is, right, for any adult um, that does not have COPD. Um, so I would say I wouldn't even like to see it 90. I want to see it greater than 92. Um, but studies show if it hits under 90, then they have bad outcomes. And then a systolic less than 90. Um, and then, of course, rapid transport um, is important as well. 
so airway management, right? Um, so ideally SpO2 greater than 90 to 93%. Um, and you should consider um, intubating these folks if they cannot protect their airway, right? Um, if they're not ventilating appropriately, despite using um, your airway adjuncts and bagging, if this is not working, then you need to think about intubating. Um, signs of cerebral herniation, and we kind of already talked about what those things are, right? So if somebody's starting to herniate in their brain, which means pressure is getting so great that it's displacing brain tissue, um, what might you see? Yeah, right. You'll get a change in their mental status for sure, right? Maybe they were kind of moaning or like they were kind of kind of interacting with you and now they're not, right? Not at all. So a change in mental status, certainly coma. Yeah. Anything else? What about like physical exam when you look at their eyes? Yeah, you might get a blown pupil, right? That's a cranial nerve palsy. So parasympathetic fibers and cranial nerve number three, which is the ocular motor nerve. Um, you also have some eye movement issues with that, right? It, it innervates some of the movement of the eye and some of the muscles of the eye and the eyelid. But parasympathetic fibers that run through it get damaged. Um, and now that's what blows the pupil because parasympathetic is going to restrict it, right? Constrict that pupil. So you get a blown pupil. Um, depending on what type of herniation... So these are all the types of herniation. Uncle, um, the one, I don't know, it's right adjacent to the bleed in the picture where that um, temporal lobe is kind of herniating down. Um, that's the that blown pupil. That's the like classic one that you see. Um, uh, but you can certainly get different posturing. You can get um, changes in mental status, coma, less alert, right? These patients are very, very sick. This is a very serious thing. Um, and then the fixed or dilated pupils. But depending on the type, you also might get um, bilateral constricted pupils. That can happen as well. So I would say any pupillary change is worth paying attention to. Um, and then anytime you have a long transport time um, or you're doing everything to support this patient's airway that you can and you just cannot keep their SATs where they need to be, um, you need to consider this. So pre-hospital intubation in patients with traumatic brain injury is also a very controversial topic, and it is because um, we tend to hyperventilate them, right? So we may, you know, expect, okay, so there's a few reasons. One is this is a trauma patient. It may be a difficult airway in general, right? What if they have facial trauma? You know, they often have seat collars on and we have to kind of be mindful of moving that neck around. Um, you know, if they have any kind of thoracic injury um, or are already hypotensive, that, that is not setting you up for success with an intubation, right? Um, so these are dangerous intubations to begin with, right? You should always have your most skilled provider doing it. You want to pre-oxygen as much as you can. Try to get them in a well-lit place. Um, make sure you have your bougie out. Make sure you have all your adjuncts. Make sure you're doing everything you can to set up for a difficult intubation. Um, but also, once we get them, so say, yeah, we get them intubated, high five, great job, moving on, we're getting them down the road, we tend to overbag, right? We do, especially in high stress situations. I overbag in high stress situations. It's not you, it's all of us. Um, and if you are hyperventilating these patients, when you hyperventilate, similar to what Dr. Davidson was talking about, right? Your DKA patients are kind of auto hyperventilating, right? Because you're blowing off acid. Right? So you're also blowing off what? This is kind of guess what I'm thinking. We measure it when we put end title on. CO2, right? You're blowing off CO2. When you drive down that CO2, you get vasoconstriction. That is the body's response, okay? And when you vasoconstrict, you don't get blood flow, you don't get oxygen, right? And it is damaging to this already um, damaged brain, right? So we have to be very, very careful. Bagging is a really big deal in these folks, like not overventilating, but also not underventilating them either. Um, so I'm not saying don't take these patients airways. Sometimes you have to, but just know that it's um, there are additional things you need to think about. All right. Uh, okay, this is kind of what we just talked about. So hypocarbia, right? So low CO2 may precipitate cerebral ischemia because you hyperventilate, you decrease the CO2, it causes vasoconstriction, uh, it decreases the blood flow, and then you get secondary ischemia and worse outcomes, right? So this is important. We don't want them to be hypoxic, but we also don't want to be them to be hypocarb, um, hypo, um, you just don't want to drive down their CO2. 
Um, so, but also acute hypercarbia may elevate intracranial pressure as well, right? So you don't want to overbag, but you don't want to underbag, right? Um, and then, of course, anytime we're doing any kind of airway intervention, please, please, please put end title on these patients. And this is for anything. Traumatic, certainly, because it will help you know if your bagging rate is appropriate, but um, it also confirms tube placement, right? You want to see that waveform to make sure you're in the right place, okay? So we want that on the patient, and we want it documented in your PCR, okay? Very important. Um, okay. Uh, so blood pressure management matters, right? We said we don't want um, their blood pressure less than 90. That's associated with bad outcomes. And it is because we think about something called the CPP down here, the cerebral perfusion pressure. You can let this fall out of your brain after I talk about it. I don't think you need to memorize this, right? Um, so this is their MAP minus their ICP, so their intracranial pressure. You will not know what their intracranial pressure is unless you have a way to measure it, right? So neurosurgery places, EVDs and things like that, and we can actually measure it. But the takeaway for you is if your MAP is less than 80, then your cerebral perfusion pressure is less than 60. And we don't want these patients to go under 70, ideally, for a CPP, okay? So if your MAP is 80, right? All right, what do we say for most people? Like, oh, MAP 65 is good. We um, we do something called MAP management in patients with severe head injuries in the hospital. And I don't know if you've ever heard that term, but MAP management means we are giving them medicines, pressors to keep their um, perfusion higher than the average human, right? So we want MAPs greater than 80 in these guys. And it's because you want to make sure you have adequate blood flow to this damaged brain to prevent these secondary injuries. So just know that high, higher is better, right? And that's kind of true for any trauma patient, right? If you have any traumatic patient or trauma patient and their blood pressure is low, like we don't like that in general, but it's, mo it's very important in patients who have traumatic brain injuries, okay? Um, so things, what can we do, right? Your blood pressure is low, what can we do? You can start with isotonic products, right? Normal saline is, is best. So give them a bolus of normal saline. If you have blood products and they have other traumatic injuries, sure. Um, and then vasopressors as necessary. Neo or phenylephrine is probably the best one because it does not, it will clamp down on their vasculature without increasing the pressure in their brain. Not everyone carries that. If you have Levo, whatever you have, use what you have, okay? Uh, but if I had to choose, if I had everything at my disposal, which we sometimes do in the emergency room, that would be my choice, phenylephrine, okay? Um, and then TXA. A lot of you guys carry TXA, right? So um, it is indicated for any um, kind of traumatic bleeding externally or internally, and that includes head injuries, right? So if your patient has a depressed GCS and they are a trauma patient, I would give the TXA, okay? Um, and especially if um, their blood pressure is low. Like I would give it, and it is in your protocols, okay? Um, there's one more thing. Oh, and then thinking about coagulation reversal, right? Something that we always want to know, is this patient on blood thinners? Is this patient on blood thinners, right? Because if they are, we can reverse it, right? Um, some places are carrying blood products. I know this is starting to roll out. FFP can reverse some stuff. So um, if you don't have it, don't worry about it. But um, sometimes you can give that. It'll also help replace volume, um, but it also will give back coagulation factors that can help with bleeding, okay? All right, we kind of looked at this already, um, but I, I like this because I think things that, the, I think a question you guys have is like, oh my God, my patient's crumping, what can I do in the, what can I do in the short term, right? So intubation if needed, of course, um, but even just elevating the head of the bed 30 degrees, right? Um, this can be tricky, right? You're like, oh, I've got them on a backboard, like they're full spinal restriction. Well, can you reverse t -bergum? Even that will help, right? Like, so you can keep them flat, but just kind of tip the head of the bed up, right? So just that alone will decrease intracranial pressure. It will buy you time. And we do this in the hospital too. Like um, if so, like someone's crumping, we know they have a, a neurologic injury, we'll put the head of the bed up. You can also give sedating medicines, things that help with pain. Because when patients are in pain, um, they, they clamp down, they're upset, and that increases um, the pressure in the brain as well. So, um, uh, intubation if they need it, raising the head of the bed or reverse T-berging them, um, osmotic agents, right, mannitol or hypertonic saline. Studies favor hypertonic saline, okay? So if you have it, a 250 cc bolus of 3%. If they're crumping in route, give it, okay? Um, if it is indicated within your protocols, which 
the 10th edition it is okay um mannitol you can you totally can give but um studies favor hypertonics if you have the option um and then we talk a lot about this brief hyperventilation right it's tricky um it's something that it only works very transiently and it's not even something we really do unless we're like crashing into the or with a patient right know that if you um briefly hyperventilate it will vasoconstrict thus decreasing icp but it also will compromise blood flow right kind of the things we were just talking about why we don't want to hyperventilate these folks okay so brief hyperventilation i would put that very low on my list of things to do okay again this is something we do sometimes in the hospital crashing patients into the or or like what they're going to get a drain or craniotomy or something like that um and then don't forget check your um cervical collar is it too tight maybe loosen it a little bit if this patient's obtunded anyway and they're not really they're not moving they're not fighting you go ahead and loosen it it's okay right make sure you're getting that venous blood flow out of the brain everything you can do to decrease the intracranial pressure and then consider sedating agents if they're intubated i hope you're sedating them anyway right because out of kindness um but if they're hurting that can also cause raised intracranial pressure okay so fentanyl some ketamine and stuff like that all right uh questions about any of that no okay uh, so moderate severe TBI treatment continues. So anti-seizure medicines, we already talked a little bit about if they seize, please treat that seizure. It um, increases pressure in their brain. It's also hypermetabolic state um, in an already damaged brain. So we want to avoid that if possible, more free radical damage, um, more excitatory kind of neurotoxins and things that cause damage we don't like. Um, but these patients will also be prophylactically put on Keppra in the hospital. We tend to Keppra load these folks, um, and then they tend to be on Keppra for a while after the insult. Um, reduces the risk of status, um, and then recurrent seizures, right, can aggravate secondary brain injury. Um, something that's worth mentioning is um, if this patient get, gets RSI'd, and they got paralyzed, are you going to see a seizure? No, you're not going to see it. So just know that. OK, and that's important for to tell the receiving hospital. Everybody's really good about giving a report and saying what meds were given. But just please do make sure we know um, if they got RSI and what paralytic they got. OK, um, avoiding hypo and hyperglycemia. Um, I would check a blood sugar in these folks, right? If they're altered in any way, you guys are going to be doing it anyway. But if it's a traumatic injury, I think maybe sometimes that gets forgotten. Um, but if their blood sugar is low, you can give them D5 normal saline, right? you can give them a little bit of sugar. That's important. You don't want to drive it too, too high, but you also don't want it to be too low. So something to pay attention to. Um, but that is, of course, further down on your list if you're managing an airway, they're bleeding to death, and you're trying to rapidly transport. Just something to uh, know. Um, avoiding fever, head of bed elevation, um, appropriate sedation and paralysis. Um, there is a thing that I mentioned earlier called neurostorming. Has anyone ever seen that or know what that is? It's kind of this weird proxismal hypersympathetic activation. And what it is is the brain is so severely damaged, you kind of think of it as just like it just goes haywire. Um, so these patients will have these episodes, and it's often brought on by kind of external stimulus. These are severe brain injured patients um, where they're tachycardic, they're hypertensive, they're sweating, they're altered, they're rigid. Um, it's pretty profound to see. Um, and it's pretty um, traumatic to families when they see their loved one doing this. Um, but this is managed with beta blockers, alpha um, um, agonists like um, clonidine, um, Presidex. Um, they also get, you know, narcotics and sedation. They may get, um, you know, paralyzed for their own benefit um, and if they're intubated, obviously. Um, but it's pretty, if you Google it and just like look at it, it's pretty, it's pretty impressive. Um, I've seen this a few times in the hospital when I was up working on the TBI as a resident. Um, so moderate and severe. And interestingly, like if a patient goes home, this could be something you get called to see. If they're like home or they're in a nursing home or rehab facility. Like they tend to know if they have a predilection for neurostorming. Like patients usually will declare themselves that they're going to be one of these patients, um, but not always. So just something to know that exists. Okay, so in hospital treatments, what do we do? Um, in addition to all the things that you guys do, we also do, obviously, um, but definitive kind of treatment. So surgical evacuation, a craniotomy. Um, this is actually within the realm of an emergency medicine uh, doctor's scope. Um, 
I hope I, I've never done one, right? Um, I've helped put a drain in, which is pretty cool. Um, but if you are at a rural place and this patient's herniating, like you can drill a burr hole in their skull, which is crazy to me to think about, but it is possible. Um, but hopefully you have a friendly neighborhood neurosurgeon to help you and they will take them for surgical evaluation or evacuation, excuse me. Um, so craniotomy, um, they'll put EVDs in, external ventricular drains. Um, those are also ways to manage um, or measure um, the pressure within the brain and they can drain it and do things to kind of keep it in a safe range. Um, so if they have a penetrating injury, they get debridement and dural closure over the brain. Um, and then depressed skull fracture, they will, um, it may not be uh, the first thing that gets done, but they'll elevate and um, kind of just fix that, um, that depressed skull fracture. And of course, debridement, because that is a sterile space, or ideally should be. Um, okay, prognosis, and we're just kind of wrapping up here. So 30% um, risk of death with increased mortality for at least 13 years with severe TBI. It's kind of weirdly worded, but uh, you can you can take that to say these patients are very sick. They have a lot of complications and their risk of morbidity and mortality is exceedingly high. They also get a lot of secondary problems, right? So if these patients are in a persistent vegetated state, right, they're bed bound, they get contractures, they get infections, sometimes they're trached, sometimes they're pegged. Um, you know, these are the folks that you guys run on it you know, rehab facilities. And they have a lot of chronic, really often sad um, secondary um, problems that they just um, kind of get throughout the years because people are not designed to lie in bed all day like that, right? Um, significant proportion of patients will regain independence in a functional recovery, which is a good thing, or at least um, partial independence and a partial functional recovery. Um, this is your in the 10th, um, your 10th edition protocols, like this is your trauma protocol, okay? This should all be familiar to you guys. Um, so you can walk this algorithm. If you have questions, if you have concerns, you can always phone home, online medical direction. We're available to you to answer whatever questions you need or have. Um, but there that is. You can look at it. This is your airway management in trauma, okay? Um, and then just head injury. This is, um, you know, things that are important for history, physical exam, um, you know, considering your C-spine restriction and any blunt trauma. And then this talks a little bit about hyperventilation and maintaining a rate of eight breaths a minute or making sure, even more importantly, put that capnography on that patient. We love capnography. We hope you guys love capnography. We want you guys to keep using it. Um, and then eye injuries, which we didn't really talk about. Um, and then being able to sit a patient up if you can. This is your um, dosing um, for TXA, hypertonic, and mannitol. So just put that in there. Um, okay, so I guess we'll talk about our girl here. So those are her vitals. That is your physical exam, airway. You think she, let's see, she's not, oh, okay, that sounds bad. All right, so sounds like we might need to consider taking this girl's airway. Good, you did, good job. All right, so you see Kurt the airway. Um, and you're making darn sure that she's not hypoxic. You've got your end title on. Um, she's intubated um, successfully, it sounds like. She's hypotensive, so you gave her appropriate blood products, TXA, um, and then the isotonic fluids. It sounds like you didn't give her any 3%. That's okay. GCS is 7. You think she's a TBI, all avoiding all the secondary brain insults we talked about. All right, so briefly, let's talk about trauma activation criteria. These are reasons to call TCC, right? There's three different types. Physiologic is first. Um, so hypotension, any kind of respiratory distress, or any um, significant altered mental status in the right patient, right? It, with a trauma mechanism, okay? If they don't meet this, then you go on to anatomical criteria. Do they meet any of these, right? Flail chest, proximal long bone fractures, um, trauma and burns, right, greater than 15%, uh, any trauma to the head, neck, box, um, or extremities that are proximal, right? So if you have a GSW that's here in the forearm that is not, and they have no other injuries, and they said, oh, I just accidentally, I shot myself in the hand when I was cleaning my gun. Like, how many times have we all seen that a lot? Um, that's not necessarily trauma activation. But say they shot themselves, then they like freaked out, fell down three stairs, hit their head, and now they're altered. Now that is a trauma activation, right? So these things can be tricky, right? And if you have any question, you just call. Um, okay, and then the third reason. So say they don't meet physiologic, they don't meet anatomic. Um, now you get to go to mechanism, right? 
Um, so do they meet any of these? And this is a lot to go. <laughs> this is a lot to go through when you have to minimize scene time and manage a potentially sick patient. Sometimes it's very obvious if they're that sick that you need to call TCC. And then we also have this loophole that is EMS provider discretion. And that is because we trust you guys and you see a lot of stuff. And over time, you get that weird spidey sense where you go, this doesn't mean anything, but I don't like this. This patient makes me nervous. Something is wrong. And studies show more often than not, y'all are right. So there's that, okay? So if you feel like this patient needs to be activated, then go ahead and do it. We want you to feel like we trust you, okay? All right. So once you've decided, yes, we are activating, that's your TCC number, one through seven are the things they're going to want to know. They give you, you guys probably know all this already, give you an ID number. That ID number needs to go in your patient care report. Um, and then please, if possible, update us if there's any clinical change. And then when you're like five to 10 minutes out, it helps us be ready to receive you, right? Um, I have had patients where they were billed as a level two, and I think they just were so sick and route. I mean, not the fault of the EMS providers, but they just didn't get a chance to update us. She was a level two. We were all just kind of like, cool, it's a level two. And this patient was sick as snot when they rolled in and got intubated, uh, got blood products, uh, had to go emergently up to the surgical suite, um, got bilateral chest tubes. <laughs> so that was not a level two, right? And that's okay. That happens, right? The pre-hospital world, um, unbeknownst to people who have never practiced in it, it is a dangerous place where things change rapidly, right? And you have to, you are asked to do a lot of things in a short amount of time with less resources while moving down a road, right? That's crazy. So we know that those things happen, but as much as you are able to prepare us for what is coming, we truly do appreciate it because it helps us have our equipment and our resources and just be mentally prepared to do a lot of things to a sick patient. Um, okay, so in summary, right, um, focus on ABCs, of course, make sure the scene is safe, D for disability, right? Um, so a good neurologic assessment, it doesn't have to be super detailed, but gross motor and sensory function, mental status, and how it has changed during your evaluation and care of the patient. Um, mental status, right, level of consciousness, pupils are important, um, treatment, is focused on preventing secondary brain injury. We can't do anything about the primary injury, it's done. But what we can do is help prevent it from getting worse. And you all have a huge role to play in that. So avoiding hypotension, avoiding hypoxia, interven intervening appropriately when needed, um, and then impending cerebral herniation, right? Um, those things that we just kind of talked about that can temporize your patient while you're getting to us. Cool. That's a lot. Questions? I usually spark some sort of online debate, I feel like, or some. Yeah, we had a couple of questions that are all revolved around the same thing, and that's the use of vasopressors to cool. reverse yeah. hypotension. So that's not really mentioned anywhere in the protocol. Okay. Um, um, obviously, we so so we don't know what, how, or when, or what the criteria might be for that. So obviously, okay. you want to reduce hypotension for second. So let's, let's talk a little bit about pressors, okay? So we don't tend to use pressors in trauma patients because it masks signs of acute blood loss, right? Like in the trauma bay, it's rare that we're using pressors, right? We're giving blood products is what we tend to do. Y'all don't have that luxury, right? Some people do carry blood products. It's starting to roll out more. Our critical care, our flight uh, colleagues do, right? So if you have them and they are hypotensive in the right setting, please give it, right? So that would be first. I would also give isotonic right? I would give normal saline. I would just give crystalloids, right? So we say give a liter of fluids. So do that if that's all you have, okay? If you think they're herniating, um, then you can give a small bolus of isotonic, but 250 cc's is not the same as a liter, right? So give them both together if you need to, if it's indicated. Um, and then I wonder if you look at your shock protocol, if there's something in there. I'm just, I don't, I'd have to look myself. But last week I gave a lecture on anaphylaxis and things like that, and we sparked a very wonderful and rigorous online uh, and in-person conversation about epi drips, right? So if you look at your protocols there, um, it does say, you know, I am, I am, and then you do have an option for IV, one to 10,000. Um, and then if you, and it says nothing about epi drip, but if you go to your shock protocol, it does say something about distributive shock and how to make an epi drip for that indication. So I wonder if somebody can look that up and tell me if there's anything in there about 
hypovolemic shock or anything like that. There may not be. There may not be. Well, it does. It does say if continued signs of hypotension at the bottom, it mentions epinephrine one to one hundred thousand push dose pressor or epinephrine infusion at the bottom. It just doesn't mention that indication of a uh, traumatic brain injury. So sometimes in other words, the, the traumatic brain injury patient could be hypertensive. Is likely going to be hyper hypo or could be start off hypertensive and bradycardic right could pushing, be pushing triad and certainly then, and then work towards hypotension right and so, so if they're it's hard to get to the shock protocol from yes that. no i understand so i would this is what i my recommendation would be this if they're hypertensive you're good you don't have to do anything right but if they become hypotensive and you such to the point where you feel like you need to do something i would give what you have and if you feel like Ooh, it's not my protocol. I don't know. Call. Call us. Okay. Because we don't want, if you explain the situation, tell me what you're carrying, I will tell you to do something about it. Right. Because I do not want those patients hypotensive. Is that a satisfactory response? Very good. We ran a little over today. All right. Sorry, um, y'all. That's okay. Great lecture. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Uh, thanks to Dr. Davidson and to uh, Dr. Willett Caldwell. We really <laughs> appreciate you. We got lunch here on the way not sure if you're in the area you can come by and join us we're going to have skills lab after lunch we're at the aniana campus of wallace state um if you're here in the classroom i'll be putting up a uh uh on the screen be putting up a qr code that you can scan this form uh the attendance form link is in the q a section if you're listening online you can also send an email to Alabama EMS challenge at gmail.com. You'll get an automated response with a link to the attendance form. Please, every individual fill out an attendance form so we can get your feedback and count your attendance. Thank you very much. We'll see you next time.